The sneak preview of If Not For Them premiered at the Final Four at the end of March, but today, executive producer Brenda Van Langen joins host Natalie Hevron to discuss everything from how she got the idea to what the next steps are, and she shares some of her favorite moments throughout the process as well. Ogumba Wallet for the win! You are locked on women's basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Hello and happy Friday. You are locked on to women's basketball. I'm host Natalie Hevern and I'm a features writer and the Atlantic 10 beat reporter for the next. Thanks for making Locked On Women's Basketball your first lesson every day. And remember, Locked On Women's Basketball is free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. Today, we'll be chatting all about the sneak preview premiere of If Not For Them, what went into the making of it, and what the next steps are, all with executive producer Brenda Van Lincoln. Thank you, Brenda, for joining me. Uh, starting off, can you explain to the listeners what If Not For Them is? Sure. If Not For Them is a documentary series that I am producing that really tells the origin story of college women's basketball. It's about the, the trailblazers, the, uh, the women and the men that supported them that uh, had opportunities and battled for opportunities, equity, uh, broke down barriers, changed social norms before the NCAA uh, was in charge of women's basketball and women's sports overall. And when did you get the idea for the project and why is now the time for you to be putting it together? Well, um, Gosh, you know, I've I've run, I've been really blessed. I've been a broadcaster for now 28 years, uh, calling women's basketball games, women's sports overall. And uh, before that, I was a college coach and a college athlete. And I've just I've had so many opportunities because of sports. And um, you know, as as I've gone through my years, realizing all that went on before um, I even had the opportunity so that I could do the things that I've done. Um, I just wanted to be involved with a project, lead a project that would say thank you to those on whose shoulders we stand. And as somebody that, you know, has been involved with women's sports all my life, playing from a young age, you know, I, and even studying it a little bit, my high school in my high, my high school senior year, I wrote my essay on the history of women's basketball. And at that time, when I graduated in the early eighties to give away my age, you know, I, um, I was able to tell some of the, the early stories, but I still have that paper and I, there was so much I didn't know at that time that wasn't available. And as I've gone through my life and I've, I've interacted with and met some of the legends in women's basketball, uh, I've just been inspired and so grateful. And I talked to Marsha Sharp, the legendary coach from Texas Tech. She and I had a conversation shortly after Pat Summit passed away. And we just talked about the fact that there have been so many coaches that are in their retirement years that were, were starting to lose their stories. And so that was my inspiration for this. Like, how can we capture those stories? And when COVID hit, I started having a lot of phone calls and I started doing some Zoom interviews to capture some of those stories. And I took and I pitched it to a video production company. Like, you know, can we do some sort of documentary on this? And, and they guided me in doing a much higher quality capture of the, the stories on camera, all the audio lights, you know, high quality cameras. And, and that's where it started. And I, as I started collecting the stories, I was focused on um, really the 1970s because Title IX was passed in 72, but the NCAA didn't take over 
women's sports until 1981, 82. And so I was really focused on what happened in those years. How did we get from Title IX passing to finally having the NCAA even be interested in women's sports? And as I started talking to people about their stories, I learned that so many of the people that were in leadership positions to help us to break the barriers, to change social norms, that they were the, the people that were there in the 70s had opportunities in the 50s and 60s leading up to that. And they became our leaders when we needed it the most. So as I started gathering all this information and, and started my interviews, I just realized it needed to be a documentary series, not just one documentary. These stories have never been told or or have been forgotten. These are like our hidden figures of women's sports. And nobody has done a comprehensive historical documentary series like this. And I just felt like it needed to be done. And with the experiences that I've had in broadcasting and interacting with so many of the legends of the game, I felt like I was the person to do it. And I'm just, it's just been such an incredible journey to be able to collect these stories. And how along the way did you decide on the 10 episodes, the titles and themes that you talk about? Um, that's a really good question because, as I said, I, I really, really focusing on the, the era of the 70s when the NCAA wasn't interested and women had to form their own organization, the AIAW, to even have an opportunity for, for women to compete at the college level. Not to mention the fact that Title IX opened up doors so that high schools would have um, sports for girls. And, and we wouldn't have college sports if we didn't have high school sports. So I was really focused originally on the era of the 70s. But when I started learning about all these these heroes that, that were the leaders in the 70s, I wanted to trace the stories back to, okay, how did they get started? And so it, it just, as I started having conversations with people, the, the story arc kind of came together for me that women that had opportunities, especially in the 50s and 60s, were the ones that were positioned to be the leaders in the 70s. And there was AAU basketball that, um, that really was – uh, limited to just the white women that had those opportunities. And then my eyes were open to the stories of the women of color that uh, were a part of segregated leagues or schools or uh, HBCUs or other opportunities, industrial leagues, that there, there are so many stories that people have never heard about. And so I wanted to do this story arc of their stories um, really the ones that I could speak to some people that had those experiences in the 50s and 60s, and then how that led to um, a, a group of women going to the NCAA in the late 60s and saying, we're ready. We want to have uh, college sports available for women. How do we, we don't have the infrastructure. Can we Can we work with the NCAA? Can we go under the NCAA? And the NCAA said, no. We're an organization for men and by men, and we're not interested. And so the women had to create their own organization. So my story arc tells about that part of the story and then what they had to do to build up to even create this organization, the AIEW, and then what happened over the next 10 years that really elevated women's sports. And it, it's, a, it's a kind of chronological in nature, but also I wanted to make sure that we were representing all parts of the country because there have been, been a few projects that have been done that, you know, might be just about uh, the Northeast or might be just about the state of Texas or maybe just about the state of Iowa. I wanted all parts of the country to be, uh, included in this story and all, all, you know, I want it to be an inclusive story. So we, we hear from people from, um, all backgrounds, you know, whether it be race related or rural and urban and just make it a comprehensive story so that we really understand how we had the foundation built for what we have today. And, you know, I've seen the sneak preview uh, and how extensive that is, but I know there's so much more to come. 
what was the research process like in not only finding out the history and um, finding people to talk to, but just also putting it all together and, and putting that timeline together? It, it was a combination of, I just, I had a lot of conversations with uh, people in the industry. Uh, I would talk to those that had coached or played or officiated or been administrators and talk to them about the concept of what I was doing. And they, you know, would say, okay, you need to talk to this person, this person, and this person. And so it just became this you know, this big uh, mushrooming situation where I, I spoke to so many different people across the country. And, and then I also, you know, dug in and found some books, um, Shattering the Glass uh, was written, uh, that was pretty comprehensive in its women's basketball history that um, I got a lot of information from, but uh, there's a book called Dust Bowl Girls. Uh, those women were inducted into the, or recognized by the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame this year, and they have an incredible story. And just, you know, different uh, books that were recommended to me over the years, uh, or over the time that I was doing this research. And and so just diving in and reading as much as I could and talking to, talking to as many people as I could, and, and then also sharing things about the project on social media because um, Andrea Carter and I did a couple of on-camera uh, question and answer sessions, and then I put that out um, and some people reacted to it and said, hey, well, what about this person? What about this person? And so uh, I, I learned about some people that I didn't know anything about and that should be a major part of the story and are going to be a major part of the story. So, um, you know, it, it was... Um, you know, just a lot of talking and reading and listening. And um, it, it's been an incredible process. Coming up next, Brenda tells me about the learning process of recording interviews, and what it was like to finally premiere the sneak preview ahead of the 2023 Final Four. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA playoffs, because right now, new customers can get a no sweat first bet up to $2,500. Yes, that's $2,500 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. FanDuel not only has great promotions every single day, but also has a safe and secure app that allows you to get paid instantly. I love how easy it is to use the FanDuel app. You can place a bet in seconds with just a couple of clicks, and there is no better place to bet all of the playoff action than America's number one sports book. And now that the WNBA season has tipped off, you can bet on that too. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get a no sweat first bet up to $2,500. That's fanduel.com slash locked on. Fanduel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. Thanks for making Locked On Women's Basketball your first listen every day. What was the learning process like as you did all this reading and listening and recording of these interviews? What new things did you learn along the way? Oh, wow. Uh, I, I learned a lot. I mean, I, I pride myself in um, having been involved with women's basketball a long time and, and knowing a lot of the history. But, um, you know, as with all of us, we all see history through our own lens, our own experiences. And it, to be able to talk to people from different parts of the country, different backgrounds, different generations, uh, it just I just learned so much more. And uh, uh, that's why I think this is going to be really important. I have you know people that I'm I'm speaking to that have um, different backgrounds than me. They they grew up in different generations. They lived in different parts of the country. And so I'm 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 you know, getting consultation from people from throughout the country. So it's not just my lens, it's not just my view, but it's 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 learning about those stories from across the country. And, uh, you know, I've learned a lot. I, I, I you know, I'd, I'd heard about the Flying Queens uh, of Wayland Baptist, but I've gotten to speak to so many of those women that played in the 50s and 60s and 70s that flew all over the country and won national championships. And I spoke to their rivals, uh, Nashville Business College, who I'd heard a little bit about, but actually getting to speak to some of them. And then, uh, you know, knowing some of the stories that, you know, they um, influenced other people over the years. Um, 
that was some of the cool stuff. You know, I, I talked to some of the coaches that uh, coaches and players, quite frankly, that um, had success in the early years, and they talk about who influenced them. And so there are just all these dots being connected that, you know, as I spoke to people, they were influenced by people in front of them. And then you connect the dots to today and the storylines of today. And, you know, everybody from, you know, Caitlin Clark and Iowa and Angel Reese and Louisiana and uh, you know, Cameron Brink and Stanford, all these people all over the country that we know in college sports today, you can trace people that have influenced them or people around them back to the beginning, um, the beginning years of, of this movement. And uh, it's just, it's really cool to connect the dots. And I think people will really see that as this documentary series comes together. And the sneak preview was premiered uh, ahead of the final four, what was it like to finally show off this project to people after a couple of years of hard work? I was, it's so much fun because I've been talking to people about it for a long time and, uh, you know, for, for a couple of years and, and gathering information and, and getting excited about it and sharing stories. But to be able to have already interviewed, and this is from generous contributions of people that are fans and coaches and administrators and officials. People have made contributions so far to our project. It's, uh, uh, it's People have the ability to make charitable contributions, and we've raised over $300,000 to be able to interview over 100 people across the country and to put together and produce that sneak preview of what these episodes are going to look like. And so to be able to showcase it on a big movie screen uh, in Dallas when there was so much excitement surrounding women's basketball nationwide, and we were able to bring in a group of people, uh, you know, over 200 people to watch this preview. And it, it was so fun to be able to share it because uh, you can talk about it all you want, but until you until people are able to see it, and you know, I think you can attest to this. Uh, once you're able to see it and see all this history that we've gathered and these incredible stories that we're uncovering, um, we've it's just, it was so exciting. It, it, it you know made me very emotional. It it was awesome to see some of those women in the crowd that got to see themselves on the big screen, which was amazing, and. For some of those people that lived through that time, for them to say, I learned so much from this, and then to have young people that are playing and coaching now see it and say, I learned so much from this. Uh, it's just this, it's it's an incredible project that I'm I'm so excited about. And we're still, you know, looking for the 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 corporate partners, the foundations, the individuals to contribute to this, to help finish this project and people are going, the people that choose to partner with us to join our team are going to be so proud of what it is that we're doing, this history that we're sharing that uh, I know people will absolutely love being a part of this. Yeah, I, I can attest uh, having seen the sneak preview now three times uh, at the final <laughs> four and then also uh, preparing to write my story uh, that you get goosebumps every time uh, you learn something new that you didn't pick up on the last time. Uh, really enjoyed it and really can't wait to see the full docu-series when it comes out. Um, you know, going back to when you were at the Final Four, what were the responses from those that you interviewed and others that came to watch the preview? Wow. I, you know, it, it, it was really interesting to see how people responded because, as I mentioned, you know, I, I was talking about the project. I was sharing some of the stories we were uncovering, what I wanted to do with this, how extensive uh, that this is going to be. And it, it, so many people said, you know, I, I had a feeling this was going to be good, but I had no idea it was going to be this good. And over and over, people said that. And I think because of the wide range of people that we were able to interview, the quality of the filming, my uh, 
production partners, Real Media, Kansas City, are fantastic and have made this a very high quality uh, video production. It looks really good. It looks good on a big screen. Uh, it, it, it looks good. The the people that we've been able to interview, the stories we've been able to capture, and on the sneak preview, it's it's just a small sampling. I I, um, I try to you know, introduce that I'm on camera saying to people, this is just a small sampling uh, because it was so hard to just squeeze it into five minute segments to preview each Sarah or each uh, episode. Um, there's so many more stories that we're going to be sharing with people that I think are just going to blow them away. And so if, if, if you're watching this and you haven't seen the sneak preview, um, it's not available um, uh, widespread distribution yet. But if you're a contributor, if you make a charitable contribution through ifnotforthem.com, just go to the website, you'll receive a link, a private link to be able to watch it yourself. So that's one of the benefits of being a team member is, is being able to be updated on things as we make progress, but also to, to see this sneak preview to get an idea of, of what, what this is all about. Coming up next, Brenda tells me about her favorite parts of the process, what impact she hopes the project has, and more. And I know this is a hard question for you to answer, but you know, of those stories that you found along the way, you know, what were some of the favorites that you had? Mm. Wow. Yeah, that that is hard because um, I'm. I made so many new friends, uh, you know, speaking to these incredible women. You know, I, I talked to some of the flying queens that flew all over the country in the 50s and 60s, uh, Cookie Baron and um, Kay Garms and Patsy Neal were, are incredible women that I just feel honored to have met. And, um, you know, Billy Moore, who was our first Olympic coach that won a couple of national championships uh, in the seventies. Um, you know, she, I, I was able to speak with her several times and then I spoke with her and interviewed her in person just a couple of months before she passed away. And, you know, those, those conversations are so incredibly meaningful, but I'd have to say my favorite, <laughs> if you know, you can't pick your favorite out of all your children. Right. And then they're, they're, they're definitely not my children, but they're my heroes. Um, is somebody that I really didn't know much about at all before I started this process. And her name is Bessie Stockard. And she, um, she has an incredible story and she was part of the Virginia Slims tour and played tennis with Billie Jean King. Um, she, she played um, basketball growing up and went to Tuskegee Institute to play in college and then ended up, being hired to start a basketball program at Federal City College in Washington D.C., didn't have a didn't have a um, an arena to practice in. Had to practice in high school gyms throughout Washington D.C. and built that program enough that they were invited to the AIAW tournament, which is basically like the Sweet 16 of now. And they took the best team in the country to double overtime in the first round and lost. But Bessie got attention for how her team, her team played in that tournament and was invited to be uh, involved with the U.S. national team as we were preparing for the first Olympics with women's basketball. So she just has this incredibly rich history to tell that not a lot of people know about and they will know about through this docuseries. Um, but she just turned 90 and earned her doctorate degree and is just this incredibly special person. And I just want her to get all of her flowers and enjoy the attention um, that she has not received over these years. And, um, you know, to have her there in Dallas at the premiere was really cool. And she's just um, she's just one of the, the special stories, but she's an incredibly special story that's part of a uh, part of this documentary series. Now, I'm sure listeners are like, how can you pick a favorite? But once you see Bessie on the screen uh, and I, I got to see her on the panel after uh, the sneak preview, you, you will definitely understand um, how how that can be the answer. Um, yeah. And then, you know, what has been your favorite part of the process of putting it all together? 
Um, I think my, I, my favorite part of the process has been sitting down in the interviews with these incredible women who don't see themselves that way. They don't see themselves as, you know, these incredible trailblazers. They just love sports. They love basketball. And um, they had opportunities to have great experiences, either because they were given to them, because they found a program that they could play with, uh, play basketball with, or because they built the program or, and broke barriers themselves. I mean, so the favorite part is sitting down with them and asking them questions and then listening. Because as they tell their stories, as they remember that special part of their history, this, this look comes over their face that they just brighten up and you can see the younger version of them as they tell their stories. And it's just, it's emotional, it's inspirational, it's, it's, it's incredible to have been a part of sitting down and, and conducting those interviews because many of them had never been interviewed about their experiences. Some had, and, and many have not, at least for a long, long time. And so for them to be able to share their experiences, their feelings, the challenges they overcame, the, the, the regrets and the triumphs, you know, all of those things, to be able to sit there and be face to face with them and, and hear those stories has absolutely been my favorite part. And then because I asked you about your favorite part, I also have to ask, you know, what's been the most frustrating part of the process? Well, I guess just that it doesn't go faster, <laughs> you know, um, to do this kind of project, um, especially the way I've decided to do it is extensive. I mean, I, it could have just been a, a small um, 45 minutes something. And, and, you know, I just interviewed a few people and tried to capture history in a really brief way. And, and that probably wouldn't have cost a lot of money and, but it wouldn't have really captured the history that I think we deserve to know and that, that needs to be told. And so maybe the most frustrating part is just the, you know, trying to, to raise the money and find the resources uh, to complete this project. And, and it's, it's happening. I'm having good success. People have contributed generously as individuals. I'm speaking with corporations, with foundations, with uh, big donors, other people right now. We're at different stages of, um, you know, people deciding how much they want to contribute. And, and people have been incredibly generous and, and definitely want to be a part of this. Um, but it just doesn't go as fast as I want it to. You know, I would love to just be able to snap of my finger and have somebody write a big check and let's go, let's produce this thing, let's get it out there. Um, and, and so, um, you know, that's the, that's the most challenging part. Uh, you know, I could have tried to go pitch this idea to a network and they, you know, if they would have liked the idea, they could have said, yes, we're going to take it. And then they took it from here. But I really wanted to be a part of gathering the stories and then putting them together in a, in a way to honor these women and also to connect the stories of our beginning to the stories of now. And I think I'm uniquely positioned to do that with all of my years of playing and coaching and broadcasting to connect that history to what is now. And so I just, I wanted to be a part of it. So I, I wanted to do this in a way that, you know, let's, let's raise the money, let's get this done, let's produce this, and then let's share it uh, with those broadcast partners and with education institutions across the country and 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 those that will definitely benefit from seeing yes we have lots of success right now we have 9.9 .9 million that watch the national championship game it hasn't always been this way how did we get here who was it that really built the foundation for what we have now and let's connect the dots of those incredible women and the men that supported them to the storylines of today. And I'm just, I'm so excited to be able to continue to work on this and, and work toward making this happen. 
And what impact do you hope this project has in the short and long term? Well, I hope that, um, I, I just hope it adds to a history that's been forgotten. You know, um, I mean, people that love sports love like, stats and history and who won this championship in this year or who were the hall of famers and and you know because of the nature of sports coverage over the years most of those history stories that we know are men's sports and people don't know uh, a lot of our our women that were coaches and players and pioneers and trailblazers. They don't know because they weren't covered in the media then. And so we don't have a lot of, a lot of stuff to look back on to even be able to, to celebrate them and honor them. And, and so what I hope is that by digging in and doing this research and having these conversations that we're going to have this incredible, incredible quality of history captured so that we have this forever that we know who the who the women and men were that really built the foundation for what we have in women's sports and then i hope this spurs conversations and efforts to dig in and find even more history you know the history that i'm capturing and in, in, if not for them at least this first season uh is really from the early 50s until the NCAA took over in the early 80s. And if this if this um, really resonates like I believe it will, I think it will spur on more projects like this. Let's let's look into the 80s and what happened in the 80s when the NCAA did take over and what <laughs> how we took steps backwards as women's sports when the NCAA took over and then had to forge through and then what progress was made in, you know, the nineties. And so I just, I hope this spurs more people to say, we had no idea. We had no idea. This is our history. And let's make sure that this history gets um, captured appropriately, that these people that did so much are honored and that those that are playing and coaching now and into the future know on whose shoulders we stand so that they can be inspired to do even more, to keep fighting for equity, to keep fighting for opportunities, because that's what those before them did and should be inspiration to, to even greater heights going forward. Thank you so much for joining me, Brenda. Where can people find If Not For Them on social media and the internet? Uh, we have a website, ifnotforthem.com. There is all sorts of information there as far as stories that we've gathered. There's video, there's uh, pictures that we've taken from our various shoots. There's a lot of information about uh, how you can get involved. You can go to our store. We've got some cool, if not for them, apparel. Um, and so all of it's on the ifnotforthem.com website. We're also on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, uh, under If Not For Them. And we would love for people to join our team, even if it's uh, just sharing a story or buying a t-shirt or making a contribution, whatever the amount, um, all of it's helpful. Uh, all of it helps moving forward uh, and, and helps us to, to put together and produce this so that we can share it with people across the country. And if you know people uh, that are in, in decision-making positions, in foundations, or uh, that give money to support women's sports generally, or corporations that would love to be tied to this, uh, to this story, uh, we, we're already having a lot of those conversations, but I feel like the right partner to just take us to the finish line is out there. And if you know them, please introduce us through uh, the, if not for them, social media uh, or through me directly, Brenda Van Lingen. I'm also on all those uh, social media platforms, but um, this is going to happen. Uh, I'd rather it happen sooner rather than later, uh, but it's going to happen. And we, we just hope that um, people will, will join us and uh, you know become part of the team because this is really special history to capture and to share. I think people are going to be really excited about it. Thanks for making Locked on Women's Basketball your first listen every day. Every dayers, 
Tune back in tomorrow on the show to hear more from Hunter M. and Lincoln, our WNBA draft experts, who I always learn so much from.